Today I want to start in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28 to 35. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. I believe it to be a continuation from the weekend. And it says this, Husbands have the obligation of loving and caring for their wives the same way they love and care for their own bodies. For to love your wife is to love your own self. No one abuses his body but pampers it, serving and satisfying its needs. That's exactly what Christ does for his church. Verse 30. He serves and satisfies us as members of his body. For this reason, a man is to leave the father, his father and his mother, and lovingly hold to his wife since the two have become joined as one flesh. Marriage is the beautiful design of the Almighty, a great and sacred mystery, meant to be a vivid example of Christ and his church. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he said, but I say to you, that you are Peter, Matthew 16, 18, that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades will not overpower it. In a series we've done in the past called I'll Build My Church, or My Church, Jesus says this word my is of me. In my pocket here is a handkerchief, and it's mine, and I could pull it out and throw it down, it would still be mine, but it would not be of me, although it's mine. Jesus, in this context, says, I will build my church, meaning of me, it's like my arm. Now, if I cut my arm off, that's going to be a different story. Are you hearing me? I can throw my handkerchief down and come back and get it a month later, and it doesn't matter. I throw my arm off my body a month, come back, and there's a problem. I said there's a problem. It's going to be very difficult to reattach it without something supernatural taking place. Are you hearing me? Because the blood in my body is what causes every member of my body to be sustained and maintain life. You cut the blood supply off, then it begins to die. Amen? So then, Jesus says this in Colossians chapter 1, or Paul writing concerning Jesus and his church in Colossians 1.18, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So Jesus is the head of the church. So Jesus and the church are connected just as much as my head is connected to my body. So church is not something we do, it's something we are. We are of Christ. We don't go to church. We are the church. Say, so we don't go to church. We are the church. We are. The, this is why people say, well, it's not a building. And you're right, it's not. But you can't be the church by yourself. No more than my finger can be me by itself. Now, it can be my finger, but if it's disconnected, it's not working well. And I can't have the use of it in my hand because it's no longer attached. So we can boast it's mine all day long, but it serves no purpose. I said it serves no purpose and it doesn't have life. And unless you are under, understand that when you were born again, that he wrote your name down in glory, it was not so that you could go to heaven, but it's so that you could become a son of God, a child of God, and he could attach you to his body. I said he could attach you to his body. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18. I love this verse because if the body of Christ would get this verse, then we would dominate the globe immediately. We would immediately dominate the globe. It says, but now God. But now who? God. Who? God. Who? God. God has placed the members. Why are you searching for a church? Let's just be honest. If you're searching for a church and you have to show up to determine if it's for you, you're not really good at being led by the Spirit. Let's just be honest. Because if you were really led by the Spirit, you could hear it first and show up the, to the church, the one that's for you, immediately without any guesswork. Hallelujah. But you show up because you need to see. 
You need to hear. Those are things that are seen. We're not led by what we see or hear. We're led by what we know on the inside. Now, if you come and you don't know yet, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that because God will help navigate you. But at the end of the day, you're going to hear here. Because if you're making a decision to attach to a local body based upon what you see and what you hear and what you like, then it's you placing yourself and not God. I said, it's you placing yourself and not God. This is why he said in this passage of scripture, the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Well, I'm not going to go to that when I don't like it. But if the Lord says, but that's where I need you. Hallelujah. <laughs> but now God has placed the members. Which one of them? Which one? Each one of them. Not just the pastors, not just the apostles, not just the prophets, evangelists, and teachers, but that's the saints. Each member, he places them in the body just as he desires, where he wants you, what he wants you to do. Where he wants you to be. Now, why is this important? Because the church is of Jesus. And Jesus will not abuse his body. Jesus doesn't mutilate it. Jesus doesn't cut it. Jesus doesn't pound on it. Doesn't abuse it. A man cutting and beating on himself has a demon, probably. Oh, you don't want to hear this. Okay. If a man is bruising his own physical body, cutting and, and beating on himself, we have scriptural evidence that they, they are probably possessed of a demon. No, what do men do? They sat. They are not going to intentionally try to hurt themselves. So we should never intentionally try to hurt our wives. Because Jesus has never intentionally, never. Intentionally and unintentionally is he hurting his body. That's why a lot of pulpits have false doctrine when they're saying, God put that sickness on you to teach something. That's a lie. He's not abusive like that. I said he's not abusive like that. No, he's the healer. I said he's the healer. Now the devil puts sickness on you. If you don't judge your body rightly and you just keep ingesting a bunch of chemicals, well, guess what? Your body's going to respond. And that's not a God problem. That's a cigarette problem. That's a high uh, fructose and other things issue. Amen? If you don't judge your body, well, God's in control. If he wants me to be healthy, I will. No, no, no. Go put water in your car. Just go ahead and fill it up with, uh, with water from your... Um, your, your garden hose. See how far it goes. Then when you go to the mechanic and say, well, you know, I just believe God would take care of it. They're like, well, amen. No, the Lord has given us wisdom. Right? Now, if we accidentally put water in the car, can he do something about it? Amen. Can he clean it out? Does that mean the car's gone? Maybe not. May have to rebuild it. And some of us, we need to rebuild some things. God can rebuild our bodies. But he's not putting something in you to harm you. He's only putting things in you to keep you running at perfection. And he places you where he wants it to be. Why is this important? Because he loves us. He cherishes us. And Ephesians tells us this relationship between Christ and the church is like a marriage relationship. And as Pastor Marcy said today, the reason why so much freedom came in the house today is because so many marriages got right this weekend. But I would say this is really what took place and is found in Revelation chapter 2. Because I believe all of us run the risk of Revelation chapter 2. At times in our own personal life. Now, Jesus is speaking to a church specifically. He's talking to the church at Ephesus. And he's talking to them about the things they've done extremely well. But he had one thing against them. <clears throat> one problem. One issue. And it was a serious issue. I said it was a serious issue. He says to them in verse 2, he says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you 
cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have persevered and have endured to my name's sake, or for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. He said, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. He said, therefore, remember from where you have fallen, rep uh, repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you what? Repent. Then he recognized another thing they hated, that he hates himself. And he says, those who hear, he'll overcome specifically. Now, what's interesting about this is that he says you've lost your first love. When we deal with marriages, a lot of times when we come down and say I do, there are a lot of things we're doing prior to the I do moment. We're very attentive to one another. We care about one another. You know, we, we're courting. We are, we are doing everything to make sure they know that I'm the one forever. We're nice. We're kind. We're long-suffering. We're merciful. When the argument comes, we try, we're the, we're the, we try to get rid of it as quick as we can cause, so we can kiss. We want the kiss and makeup. We don't want the argument. But once we've come together, we've become one flesh. We've been in the house together for a year, two years, the honeymoon's over. All of a sudden, those beautiful feet don't look so beautiful anymore. The routine of coming home to the same person. The routine of hearing the same voice. The routine of, of living life day in and day out. All of a sudden, it's not that they're not the same person or that they've even progressed and become someone even greater in God. It's just that to us, it becomes familiar. And we do this with the church. The reason why the atmosphere in worship's like this today is because we were renewed for those. You know, when you get 160 people that get jacked excited about their relationship with one another and how that is an example of their relationship with God, and they're like, man, I just need to come in here and worship my king because I was forgetting about the wife of my youth and how beautiful she was and how awesome she is. And you know what? She's really gone through a lot and has passed a lot of tests. And who am I to complain about this? I'm actually a really blessed man. Yeah. And the wives are saying, you know what? My husband's done a really good job, actually. You know, when I look at all that they've done, where they could, what could be mad, what am I doing? And all of a sudden we renew. And then when we get into places that we don't care, but you know what? We apply faith to it. Yes. Yes. Then things begin to manifest. Yeah. And then when we get crazy and actually have sex with one another, yeah. like more than the world does. Because yeah. we're the only lawful, authorized people to have that kind of form of intimacy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. I will not let the world outsleep me. Yes. It's not going to happen. Y'all going to be all right? Some of y'all struggling already. It's all right. I mean, good thing we don't have to bail because I understand we have kids. They need to learn. Don't think these teenagers aren't seeing this on Snapchat, TikTok. Don't think it ain't happening on sitcom. All they hear is seeing is guys holding hands, girls kissing. And I'm going to talk about sex right now in the church. Because we have children's ministry and they could be there. The youth are here and they definitely need to hear about this. Because half of them have been sending TikTok uh, uh, new photos of each other around and that needs to stop. Are you hearing me? Because we'll lose our first love, we'll make church a routine, and we won't get up in here and worship God, be passionate about the one who laid down his life for God, died on the cross. Are you hearing me? No, we need to be an example in the home and then let it overflow into the church. Why? Because we're in the church first. I said, we're in the church first. How do I know this? All you got to do is go back to the book of beginnings. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He makes all these great things. Then he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And he makes this man out of the dust of the earth, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living spirit, a living soul. He's in the image of God, the DNA of God. He has a direct relationship with God, and he's the only person in the planet. Are you hearing me? Yes. And then he 
he says, it's not good for man to be alone. So he has him fall down into a deep sleep. He doesn't make another skin suit and breathe into it. He pulled out of the man from the side of the man what was already contained within the man. And he formed a woman. And when Adam saw this, he said, this is woman. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they'll become one flesh. Meaning we have a relationship. This spirit that all of a sudden got multiplied into two. Had a relationship with God before we ever said I do. So it isn't God marriage. Or God, family, church. It's God, church. You're not going to have family. You're not going to have marriage. You're not going to have nothing until you realize you're of the church. That the relationship with God is supreme in authority. Because when Jesus says here in Revelations, he says you've lost your first love. He says you've forgotten the priority that I am to be preeminent. In all your life and your decision making and how you do everything, you have come into my presence in a traditional sense, knowing what to do, but you don't actually consult me first. You don't make me first priority. You show up when you want to. You come when you want to. You do what you want to. Then you consult with me. You take things that were of mine, do it in your own ability, and then you want to give me glory for it. The minute I slipped a second, that's a problem. And the many of we, we in our weekend of our marriage banquet, the only reason why these marriages weren't on fire is because they didn't put that relationship as a higher priority than their work relationship, than their children relationships, than their friend relationships, because they got bored with someone. They became familiar. They forgot to see, since the butterflies in their stomach, what made them fall in love with them in the first place. Because in actuality, you're of me. How can I look at you and not see me? I said, how can I look at you and not see me? This is what Jesus is saying. How can I look at you and not see me? Because you're of me. You're my church. And you know Jesus longs to spend time with us. So what should church look like? You come in ready, excited, can't wait to assemble with the rest of the saints because God's planted me in Anchor Faith Church. It pleased him so that I could grow, prosper, strengthen, uh, be something great. He put me in his kingdom so the king could oversee my life and make me a child of the king so I'm a king itself because he's the king of? Who are those kings? You are those kings right now, not when you get to heaven, but today. Today. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your will be on as it is. We don't have to wait to heaven to get heaven to show up in our lives because the kings of the earth have dominion again. But that's when God's first. When he's first. When he's first. When he's first. When he's preeminent. When he's the source and supply. Of all that we are and do and know that if I seek you first, then it just overflows into my marriage. It overflows into my relationship. Say, well, but I'm not even married, Pastor. Uh, I'm just a single person. Well, then you ought to be the first one in church. You ought to be the first one. Why? Because you should, as Paul said, listen, in 1 Corinthians 7, he said, listen, it's not a command. Uh, it's just my opinion. But listen, if you can remain single, do so. Because you don't have to deal with the uh, spouse, meaning you have to care for them. That's someone you're going to have to be obligated. That's someone you got to, you're not independent of. You are fully dependent on them. You're going to serve them. You're going to cater to them. You're going to prefer them. You're going to honor them. Male or female, doesn't matter. In the marriage relationship, husband and wives are doing this and they're jockeying to serve each other because they want to be able to be a blessing to one another. But when you're single, you can just focus on God and God alone. So you got to be first here. First one down in the altar. First one worshiping God. First one running. Because your whole relationship's driven by the King of glory. Amen. 
Or are you running around trying to find your man? Are you running around trying to find your woman instead of letting God bring them? Amen. He'll bring them. I said he'll bring them. And it's not on your time, it's on his time. And some of you need to get some things right before he can bring them. Because who he has for you is better than you think. And you don't have to settle. So you need to be the best for them. Are you hearing me? But this just comes natural when you love God. I said it comes natural when you love God. And so, man, we get in an atmosphere like today. Why? Because we begin to remember intimacy. Yes. That's right. Intimacy. Hallelujah. This is why I, str I struggle sometimes with how church has become, institutionally speaking. Bringing them in, getting them out. It's just lectures. It's just lectures. Let me ask this. Who said you had to be in your seat right now and you couldn't come down and begin to worship God right here? Now, you're not going to be able to interrupt a sermon, but who says that if God didn't move, you couldn't come down here and just begin to minister to him? Who says you had to wait till an altar call to say, man, I need to get right. I got to come down and get right. Yes. Amen. I mean, as long as you don't attack the stage, there's going to be no problem. If you attack the stage, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> Not lecture moments. These are intimate moments. Why cannot our singing go longer? Depends on how much we just want to sing. And the Lord says, oh, they're not just doing a routine. Let's just sit and hear this a little bit longer. And then the atmosphere stays. And in the atmosphere, people get healed. Demons get cast out. Start running. Say, a demon could come in here? A demon came into synagogues with Jesus. But he kicked them out. Right? They're not going to stand against the anointing. Not in this house. Amen. Why? Because God's in this place. And he's looking for a church that wants to be intimate. I mean, we're full of instruction. We're going to continue to grow and have those expressions. But I believe God just wants us to minister to him. Jesus said in Ephesians chapter 5, the Passion Translation, verse 32. He says, Marriage is a beautiful design of the Almighty, a great and sacred mystery. Meant to be a vivid example. Christ church. I love all aspects of my wife, spirit, soul, and body. I love her by her spirit first because she's a conqueror in Christ. And I've seen her through her soul realm, her mind, her will, and her emotions. Yield in every test of what the Spirit of God says to her spirit, and she's an overcomer. Amen. That's the sexiest thing on the face of the planet. Amen. The body is just what houses her. And so when I'm around her, I'm not intimate with her just because of her outside, but because who she is really on the inside. Amen. I like to drive and I reach over, and she touches my hand. I like to hear her voice. When I'm traveling, she's not there. Because of technology, I FaceTime. If I could FaceTime God, I would. 
I'd much rather see her than just hear her voice, but at times if all I can do is hear her voice, I would just want to hear her voice. Because we're intimate. And then there's times we come together. Y'all know what I'm talking about, coming together? And sometimes in those moments, it's like, don't stop. Can this thing last for five hours? Y'all all right? Don't look at me like that, because all of y'all going to movies, and you're seeing fornicators and adulterers relationships all the time. You don't ever see in the movies husband and wives in the bed. But it's like, man, I don't want this to end. But we come to church and we can have an intimacy with God greater than that moment. When we know how to make him first. To where we're like, I don't want it to end. What would it look like if we all showed up and says, we're going to press in and be intimate with God. And it just became so full of his spirit that we're like, man, I just don't want it to end. And you're not going. Now, maybe a guest to do that. I get it. You know, they don't, maybe they don't know who they are in Christ. Maybe they're just checking it out, trying to see what fits them. You know, they don't know. They don't know any better. But for us who know, we should give such a vivid example, not only in our personal lives as husband and wife because we prefer each other, but when we come together in this thing that we're so passionate about God. Let me just tell you something. If you have a bad marriage, you're uncomfortable with those who have good ones. And you don't want to hang out with them. So that's why some people aren't going to come and stay at Anchor Faith Church because we have such a great relationship in our worship. And so free to have expressions. Are you hearing me? Are you just passionate for the Lord? What rekindles things in our personal marriages? Old photos, memories of things we did, looking back at our children when they were just babies, putting ourselves in those moments that remind us of why we were together. How much more in the church when we're like, but God, being rich in his mercy, while we were still sinners, Christ died for me. He died for me. When I was separated, cast off, Doomed in rebellion. But God, in fulfillment of his father's word, gave me an opportunity that by faith I could call on his name and get back into the house. Not just get in the house so I can go to heaven when I die, but get back in the house and begin to live with him now. Begin to sit with him now. Be a part of the vine now. Get engrafted in now. Have fruit now. Be intimate with God now. Hear his voice. And at times, even get caught up in the spirit. Yes. And the natural would say, when's the last time you dated your wife? When's the last time you did this? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you came to church and said, I'm not going to leave till I touch his hymn. Yes. And get what I came for. get what I came for. Because he wants to see me. He wants to talk to me. He wants to spend time with me.